God is making priest holy. Remember when we were learning about the priest in um, Exodus? What makes the priest holy? The garment is not the priest itself, right? It. What makes the priest holy is the garment of the priest that makes him holy. And is that the really the garment? So does that mean anybody who put on that garment is holy then? If the garment itself is holy, right? Anybody can just put on the garment will, will be holy, even if it is not a priest? It's not true. So what really makes the priest holy? is, Of course, it's a garment, but who makes the garment the holy? The God is. God makes the garment holy, and the who put on that garment is holy. So God is the one who keeps saying, I'm the one who is making you holy. Because they're the one who gives the Lord's food offering. You have to make verse 8, it says, You shall sanctify him, for he offers the bread of your God. He shall be holy to you, for I the Lord who sanctify you am holy. So God is making the priest holy because he's the one who gives a food offering to the Lord. We'll continue on verse 10. The priest who is chief among his brother on whose head the anointing oil is poured and who has been consecrated to wear the garment shall not let the hair of his head hang loose nor tear his clothes. He shall not go in to any dead bodies nor make himself unclean even for his father or for his mother. He shall not go out, to, uh, out of the sanctuary lest he profane the sanctuary of his God. For the consecration of anointing oil of his God is on him. I am the Lord. He's asking the priest shall not go out of the sanctuary. What does that mean? Is that means the priest must live in the sanctuary? Never go out of the sanctuary? He has to stay in the sanctuary all the time? You're not allowed to uh, leave the sanctuary? What does that mean? I mean, when we read something like this, like, oh, yeah, whatever. Then we pass on. But when you actually think about it, what does that really mean? N not leaving the sanctuary. Hey, can you can you speak up? I I couldn't hear you very well. So this is not a literally telling the priest to stay in sanctuary all the time. He's not telling the priest to stay in and never leave the sanctuary. When you think of it, what is a sanctuary? What is a sanctuary? Exactly. The presence of God uh, makes a sanctuary. As I mentioned, tabernacle is nothing more than a place where God resides. But if God leaves, that's not a tabernacle anymore. It's not a holy place anymore. It's just nothing more than a big tent. So what makes the tabernacle holy? Because the God is in there makes the place holy. Where God is, that's the place is holy. So then I want you to think about it from today's world. 
What is a sanctuary? The sanctuary is the church where we go to. What is a sanctuary? We are the sanctuary. Why? Right. The sanctuary is where the God is exist, right? Because the God is in us, we are the sanctuary. Not the building that where we go to is the sanctuary. People call the church building as a sanctuary, is a church. The church is not a building. Sanctuary is not the building or the place. It is the people who are with the Lord as a sanctuary. Right? So then, do not go out of, of the sanctuary. What is that supposed to mean then? Never leave the Lord. Never leave the Lord. You should always stay with the Lord. Whatever we do, wherever we go, we always stay with the Lord. Not what we do, what, what we want, but do what God wants. Lest he profane the sanctuary of his God for the consecration of the anointing oil of his God is on him, I am the Lord. Because the anointed priest, it is not the, just the priest, who become a priest? What is the requirement to become a priest? Hmm? Can any can anyone become a priest? Correct. Not everyone can be the priest, right? He has to be a direct sons of Aaron. And then you should not have any cuts or blasphemy in the body. So then, if that's the requirements, just because this person is direct descendants of Aaron could become a priest they have the requirement to become a priest but they have to go through the consecration process they have to be anointed by oil even after the sanctuary was designed and created exactly the way that God told them to create until you anoint every parts of the sanctuary the tabernacle is not called the tabernacle. Not only every article of the tabernacle has to be anointed, but the priest has to be anointed. If you're not anointed, and if you don't go through the consecration process, you're not a, a priest. Even if you put on a garment, you're still not a, a priest. You have to be anointed. And as I said before, just because we go to church, just because we are attending service, does not make us to be a Christians. It does not make us to be the sons of God either. Many of the people believe that just because we're attending church, that I read the Bible, that I actually do the things that what church is guiding us to do, makes us to be Christian. Not at all. Never. What makes a Christian then? What makes a sons of God? Hmm? What, what makes us sons of God? You don't know? It's like a, you're like a <laughs> muffled. <laughs> it 
Max, you you use uh, you know the headset with the mic, but it seems like it it's like it is coming from like very far distance. Exactly. Yeah. All right, let's, you know, we, we've gone through many times, but let's just go back to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8 is, it's, many people calls it the precious stones of the Romans itself. Chapter 8. We're going to read. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of a sin and death. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do. By sending his own son in the likeness of a sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned the sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh but according to the spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their mind on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the spirit set their minds on the things of the spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind of, on the spirit is the life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is the hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If in fact the spirit of God dwells in you, anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him wait a second hold on what is he saying if the spirit of God does not dwell in him you don't belong to Christ it doesn't matter what you claim it doesn't matter what you say if the spirit of God is not residing in you you don't belong to Christ at all. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, many people think the believing in Jesus Christ and the receiving the Holy Spirit is two distinctive things. It is not. You receive the Holy Spirit when you truly believe in Jesus Christ. We can confess that we believe in Jesus Christ. We can say it. You know, anyone who speaks a language can say that I believe in Jesus Christ. Whether it's, a, whether it's a truth or not, you can say it. You speak about it. But just does not mean that you truly believe in. And I told you, difference between conviction versus the belief. You can say to yourself, I believe God. You can say that. Then who acknowledges your own faith? You do. You say, I believe. But who needs to acknowledge your faith? God is, not me. I'm not the one who says, oh, I believe in you. But God has to acknowledge that I believe. When we believe, what do we receive? Holy Spirit as a gift. In return, we receive the Holy Spirit. This is, I, this is why I mention Matthew chapter 7 says this. Go to Matthew chapter 7. Verse 15 and on. Beware of a false prophets who come to you in sheets, clothing by inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? 
So every health tree bears a good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire, though you will recognize them by their fruits. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven, on the day may, uh, on that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I will never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. What, what does this mean? Many, many will say, Lord, Lord, haven't I done this? Haven't I prophesied? Haven't I done all these mighty things in your name? Well, that means they have done something. At least they claim they have done something for the Lord. But what about all this mighty work they have done? What about all this, the time and money and effort that, that you put in? But what if God said, I don't know. I don't know what you did. If God does not recognize what you did, if God, not, God, does, if God does not rec, you know, acknowledge the things you have done, what good is it then? We wasted our, waste of our time, money, effort, everything. Right? This is something that many of the Christians need to think about. It's not about what I do. It's about what pleases the Lord, whether we actually do it the way that God told us to do. We do it the way God told us to do. <clears throat> Imagine, you went to a, the barber shop, right? You go, you go to barber shop, and you tell the barber and said, hey, I want to uh, cut my hairs this way, I, you know, cut short here, and, you know, a little short in the back, but leave the, uh, the top a little long so that it lays down. And if the barber comes and said, you know what? No, 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 no that's not how it's supposed to work. But according to your face, you know, I think, don't worry, I'll take care. And then he cuts it. And then when you actually put on the glass, the, your hair does not come out the way you, you told them to do. You just come out completely different than how you wanted it. Then what would you say? <laughs> you could get your money back, but you can't get your hair back. <laughs> I don't mind. I, I don't mind giving that money back. But I want my style. <laughs> All right? <clears throat> so you'll be are you be happy? No, I'm not going to be happy because I want my my hair to you know come out the way I want it, right? But think about it. Barber spent his time right cutting and thinking that this is how sh that your hair should look on your face. But for you, you don't care. <laughs> <laughs> what he thinks, right? He might have he might have put a lot of time and effort, and he was thinking about it. And, you know how, you know you, this hair will look perfectly on you, but that's his perspective. That's not what I want, right? Same thing. God is telling us what to do, but if we do completely different, God will not be happy. God will not acknowledge the work that you put in. And we always acclaim ourselves, what about the time I spend? What about the times that I've actually spent in church? What about the Bible study I've gone? What about the mission work that I have done? What about the, the teaching that I gave to my children, my youth, all the work that I have put in? What about these? And God would say, I don't know what you did. Then that's a that's a big problem. 
And when I go to church and when I actually meet a lot of the, the people who's been, you know, attending church service for many, many years, here's what I hear the most. I was born in a Christian family. My father's was a so-and-so. You know, my grandfather was a missionary. You know, my grand-grandfather was like, you know, he was a pastor. So I say to them, what does that mean to you? What does that mean to God? When you actually encounter the Lord at the end of the day, are you going to say, my family is Christian family? I've been going to church for 50 years? Don't mean anything. It's not about what you did. Whether you follow the way God told them to do or not. <clears throat> Going back to what I was saying before, I met a lot of Christians have their own faith, their own belief, but don't know the Bible. They don't know what God said. Because you don't know what God said, you don't do what God said because you simply don't know. I want you to remember, it's not about what we do. It's not about what I think. It's about what God said, what matters. <laughs> and right after that, chapter 7, verse 21 through 23, what's What is the, the context right after that one? Reading from verse 24. Everyone, Matthew chapter 7, verse 24, everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will, like, will be like a wise man who build his house on the rock. And the rain fell, the floods came, and the wind blew, blew and beat on that house, but it did not fail, did not fall, because he had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blows blow, blew and beat against the house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. I want you to connect these together. He mentions about not everyone who calls on his name will not enter into the kingdom of God. Okay? And then, the right after he said that, there are two people. One is wise man, there's a foolish man. The wise man is the one who builds the house on the rock, and foolish man is the one who builds the house on the sand. So when you look at it from the house perspective, effort and time and material that you actually use to build a house is equally the same. What makes the difference is the foundation, either on the rock or the sand. So I, as I mentioned, what makes the difference is just the base of it, not the house itself. House is what you put on. You build a house. You put your time in it. But where do you build your house on is, is what makes the difference. What is the rock versus what is a sand then? What is a rock? Hmm? Word of God? Very similar. What is the rock based on what we have learned? Exactly. Jesus. Right? The rock is the Jesus. He's the cornerstone. Right? 
you build a house on Jesus. So then I ask always the questions. What does that mean? You build a house on Jesus. What, do you, what, what is that supposed to mean? Hmm? What does that practically mean to, mean to us? Build a house on Jesus. What is that supposed to mean? How do we build a house on Jesus? Once again, we talked about rock is Jesus. Right? Rock is Jesus. But John chapter 1 says what? I always reference John chapter 1 because John chapter 1 is critically important. Let's go to John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of them. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God, whose name was John. He came as witness to bear witness out the light, that all might believe through him. He was not the light but came to bear witness about the light, the true light, which, was, which gives a light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world has made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believe in his name, he gave the right to become children of God who were born not of blood nor of the will of flesh nor of the will of a man but of God and the word the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we have seen his glory glory as of the only son from the father full of grace and truth now verse 1 says in the beginning was the word and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, which makes no sense whatsoever, right? When you actually read it, it does not make any sense. Word, with, word was with God, but Word is God. What is that supposed to mean? But we're, gonna get, we're not going to get to that this. I mean, we'll get to this when we get to John later on. <laughs> And I'll give the full explanation what this means, but for now, today, we're not going into it yet. But, so the word is Jesus. Word is Jesus. The word that put on a flesh and came to this world, which is Jesus Christ. So the, going back to what I was saying before, Matthew chapter 7, you build a house on Jesus. You build a house on rock. So you build house on what? On the word. The word. What's the word then? What's the word? The word is the Bible. The God's word. The Bible is the one. So if you don't know the Bible, you cannot say you know Jesus. Because the word is Jesus. If you don't know the word, you don't know Jesus. You claim yourself, I know Jesus. I heard about Jesus. But if you don't know the word, you don't know Jesus. And if you don't know the word, that means you cannot build your house on the rock. House is like what I put in. Your effort, your time, your energy, your money, everything that you put on. You can build beautiful house. But if you don't build on the word, your house is meaningless. When the rain comes, when the wind blows, when it beat it on, it's going to fall. When the hard time comes, you will fall. 
because you, you don't have a strong base at all. I asked this question. You know that in New York City, <clears throat> in Manhattan, all of you have been to Manhattan, right? In Manhattan, there's a lot of high-rise building, right? The sky, skyscrapers to all over the place. Almost every building is a skyscraper. It's like very tall buildings, right? Out of many states in the United States, there is no city like Manhattan. You know why there is a, so many skyscraper and a very high-rise building and concentrate in New York City? Sounds like a very dumb question. Huh? What, what did you say, Max? Well, I want you to think about it. Is that because the engineers and the architect could not really don't have a skills in other cities? Is that why there's not many skyscraper in other cities? Certainly not, right? Then why all these skyscrapers are concentrated on Manhattan? Then you may say, like, I don't live in Manhattan, so I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Manhattan, right underneath, is all rock. It's complete rock. So you can build anywhere in Manhattan. The high-rise building anywhere in the New York City, it's possible. Other cities, you are limited to where you can build a skyscraper. Because the land is not strong enough. When you actually ever been to Seoul, right? There are some tall buildings. But there are not many tall buildings in, in, in Korea. The reason is, the foundation is not strong. We don't have a rock everywhere. That's why they cannot build the high-rise building. In Manhattan, you can build a high-rise building anywhere in New York City, in Manhattan, because it's a, it's a rock. You can build anything. But in other places, you can't. You are limited. You could only build a high... Not because they don't have a skill set. Not because they don't have engineers. Not because they don't have a real good architect. They do have it. They just cannot build because the foundation is not strong enough to support those high-rise buildings. By the same token, if you build your faith upon the word that is written in the Bible, your faith stands still. If you don't have the word, and if you don't have a, if you don't build your faith on top of the word, then you're basically put all your effort and time and energy and money and everything else go down the drain very easily. It's gonna fall. When the hard time comes, you will struggle. That's the difference between the people who have a nice house but never built the house on rock versus the nice house that was built upon rock. Word is the one who supports you. If you don't know the word, your faith is meaningless. This is why you are learning the word because you want to build your faith upon the Word. If you don't know what God said, how will you be able to follow what God said? You simply don't know. Let's come back. 
Example will be very simple. Many people coming to church or raised in church, right? You attended the word, uh, you attended the service, you heard the word, never understood the word that is written in the Bible. When you read this Old Testament, you will hear this word repeatedly. Do as I said. Do what I commanded you to do. So let's just turn to uh, Numbers for a second. Book of Number. <clears throat> let's turn to, towards the end of it. Actually, you know what? Instead of uh, probably Deuteronomy would be better. Let's do uh, Deuteronomy instead of Numbers. Towards the end of it. Let's turn to uh, Deuteronomy chapter 27. <clears throat> now Moses and the elder of Israel commanded the people, saying, Keep the whole commandment that I commanded you today. And on that on the day you crossed over the Jordan to the land that the Lord your God is giving you, you shall set up large stones and plaster them with, with plaster. And you shall write on them all the words of this law when you cross over the uh, cross over to enter the land that the Lord your God is giving you, a land flowing with milk and honey, as the Lord the God of your father has promised you. And when you have crossed over the Jordan, you shall set up these stones uh, concerning which I commanded you today on Mount Ebar. You shall plaster them with plaster, and there, and there you shall build an altar to the Lord your, your God, an altar of stones. You shall build no iron tool on them. You shall build an altar to the Lord your God of uncut stones, and you shall offer burnt offering on it to the Lord your God, and you shall sacrifice peace offerings. Shall uh, you shall eat there, and you shall rejoice before the Lord your God, and you shall write on the stone on the word of the law very plainly. What is he saying? <laughs> right before you entered the promised land, God is telling them to put the stone, the big stone. But you know what? You're not supposed to cut that stone. It has to be natural stone. Okay? When, when you look at the verse 6, You shall build an altar to the Lord your God of uncut stones. You're not supposed to cut the stones. It has to be natural stones, but big stones. What is this stone? It's representing Jesus. What do you do on the stone? Huh? What do you do with the stone? Verse 8. You shall write on the stone all the words of the law very plainly. What do you write? 
What do you write? All the words of the law. What does this represent? Absolutely. Uncut stone. The man should not touch this stone. So verse 5 says, There you shall build an altar to the Lord your God, an altar of stones. You shall build no iron tool on them. You shall build an altar to the Lord your God of uncut stone. Man should not alter the stone. You should not put any iron on the stone. Because, Jesus, you cannot cut the stone by man's hand. It has to be natural stones, the way it was created. You put on the command of the law. The way I told you to do. Don't do the way you want. Do it the way I said. Going back to Max's question. What is examples of it? People who grown up in the church, they believe what they want to believe. Rather than believe based on what God said. They built their, built their own faith. If I do this, God will be happy. This is how I make God happy. Without knowing what God said. What I think or what I believe that I will make my God happy versus what God said could be very different thing. I believe, so I'm saved. Versus what God said, we are saved. What I want to believe versus what God said is a two distinctive different thing. Therefore, there are a lot of a people in church built their own faith without following the God's words, without receiving the Holy Spirit, without knowing the word, they said, I'm saved. God, God, this, when I do this, God will be happy. And as we said in Matthew chapter 7, you do all this mighty work. You call on my name. You prophesize, but I don't know you. We do it the way God told us to do. We believe the way God told us to believe, not the way I want to believe, not the way I believe. There are, so there are a lot of the Christians who are coming to church on Sunday. They believe that they are saved. They follow God's way, but they're not. And as I mentioned, if the Spirit of God, the Spirit of God is not dwell in you, you don't belong to Christ. It doesn't matter what they claim. It doesn't matter what they what what they call. I'm a Christian. Yeah, you call yourself Christians, but not according to the Bible. Or according to what you think, not according to the Bible. So if you don't know the word, you will never be able to follow because you simply don't know. And that's the kind of teachings that I have received when I was growing up in church. That's what I thought was a good faith because I was attending service every week, participating in all this church activity. I thought I was a good Christian, a faithful Christian, because I do all this compared to other people outside the church. But that don't mean anything. Just because you were actually involved in a church activity, just, just because you attended the service, because you actually participated in a you know, praise team, don't mean anything. It is the word that we must know and believe the way that God told us to believe. Not the way I want to believe. Does that answer your questions or are still unclear? Okay. 
Many of the people I have met that said, I read the Bible. Okay? Reading the Bible. I read it twice, three times, five times, ten times, fifteen times. You know? I'll give you one example. I said, you know, I have uh, the music sheet. Okay? I have a music sheet. I sang it 10 times, 20 times, 30 times. I can memorize all this lyric and I can sing the song. But you know what? I don't know how to read this, uh, the sheet. I don't know how to, how to read sheet. I just remembered the melody so I, I could sing. But when I actually look at the sheet, I'm not reading the sheet. Because I don't know how to read this sheet. Right? Isn't there so many people like me? There's a music sheet in front of them, but they just can't read the sheet because they never learned how to actually read the sheet. Right? They don't even know where's the, uh, you know, C, D, when there's like the code, what is that supposed to mean? Why is it E? Why is it D? Why is it G? They don't understand. They just know the melody. That's all. Just because I sang it 10 times and 100 times, just because I know the melody, does not make me to know what the sh how to read the sheet. Right? You have to learn how to read the music. You have to learn to how to read the music. Same thing. Just because you can sing does not mean you can read the sheet. Same thing. Just because you read the Bible does not mean you understand what you're reading. You just read it because you've been told to read the Bible. But without understanding what you're reading, just because you read it 10 times doesn't mean you know what God is saying. This is why you have to learn how to read the Bible. This is how you should learn how to read music. You can literally, you can literally actually play the music without reading the sheet. If you remember the chord, C, okay, C chord, all right? G chord, right? You can press the, the, the keyboard. You can play music, but you don't know how to read the music. Then you can't go far. You can't be created. Same thing. You heard so many sermons, you have attended so many Bible study. So you know pieces here left and right. But you don't understand what that really means? That's not really helpful to me. To build a faith. You interpret it the way you want to interpret it rather than how it is originally meant to, meant to say. That is not a belief. That is not a faith. You don't do it the way we want. We do it the way God told us to do. Following His way. I come across many of the people saying, oh, you know, Old Testament is so hard. It is hard. It is hard. And you know what? The people don't read the Old Testament because, first of all, it's too thick. Right? It is a thick. And even if you read the Bible, it just, ah, uh, it's so difficult. Yeah, it is. If you don't know, how to read the Bible, it will be difficult for you. But if you're learning the Bible, Old Testament is very fun to read. Because you're learning. But if you don't know it, if you just, oh, go and read the Bible. Yeah, that's very helpful. 
It's like this. You're giving the music sheet. Hey, here's the sheet. Read it. But you don't know how to read. Then how are you going to read the, read the music sheet if you don't know how to read music? You have to learn how to read music and then you can read the music. This is exactly why we're learning this word. How to read the word. What does this mean? Coming back, verse 16. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron, saying, None of your offspring throughout your generations who has a blemish may approach to offer the bread of God, for no one has a blemish shall draw near, a man blind or lame or one who has a mutilated face or limp too long, or a man who has injured foot, a foot or an injured hand, or a hunchback, or a dwarf, or a man with a de defect in his sights, or an itching disease, or scabs, or crushed testicle. No man of the offspring of Aaron, the priest who has a blemish, shall come near to offer the Lord's food offering. Since he has blemish, he shall not come near to offer the bread of his God. He may eat the bread of his God, both of the most holy and of the holy things, but he shall not go through the veil or approaching approach the altar, because he has blemish, that he may not profane my sanctuaries, for I am the Lord who sanctify them. So Moses spoke to Aaron and to his son and to all the people of Israel. I want you to know this. Even if the man is a son's a direct descendant of Aaron. If the son is found in ble a blemish, you cannot go beyond the veil. Although you are direct descendants of Aaron, you cannot have blemish to go into the holy of holy place. Why? What does it really tell you? If we have a sin, we can never go beyond the veil to encounter the Lord. Only way that we can go into the holy of holy place should not have blemish sinless how could we be sinless then only through the blood of Jesus Christ we can be sinless then we can enter into the holy of holy place not by my will not by what I did by the blood of a Jesus Christ that I only could go into the holy of holy place and I could only be sinless. No matter what I tried, I cannot make myself a sinless. No one can make me to be sinless, but only through the blood of Jesus Christ. He's the, he's, he's the only one who can make us to be sinless. If we have the sins in us, we can never enter his house. Just because we are called to be Christian does not make us to go into the holy of holy place. Even if it's the sons of Aaron, you cannot enter the holy of holy place until you are blameless. Chapter 22. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron and his sons, so that they abstain from the holy things of the people of Israel, which they uh, dedicated to me. 
so that they do not profane my holy name. I am the Lord. He keeps saying, I am the Lord, I'm, I am the Lord, I'm, I'm holy. Say to them, if one of all your offspring throughout your generation approaches the holy things that the people of Israel dedicated to the Lord while he has an uncleanness, that person shall be cut off from my presence. I am the Lord. Unless you are clean, you cannot come to him. Unless we are sinless, we cannot come to him. Only way that we can be clean is only through Jesus Christ. Not by my will, not by what I did, only through his blood. We can only be clean. None of the offspring of Aaron who has leprous disease or discharge may eat of the holy things until he is clean. Same thing what I said. Whoever touches anything that is unclean, though contact with dead or a man who has had an emission of a semen, and whoever touches the swarming things by which he may be made unclean or a person from whom he may take uncleanness, whatever his uncleanness may be, the person who touches such a thing shall be unclean until the evening and shall not eat of the holy things unless he has bathed his body in water. When the sun goes down, he shall be clean, and afterward he may eat of the holy things because they are his food. He shall not eat what dies of itself or if torn by beast, and so make himself unclean by it. I am the Lord. They shall therefore keep my charge, lest they bear sin for it and die thereby when they profane it. I am the Lord who sanctify them. What is he saying? They shall, they shall therefore keep my charge. What does that mean? Exactly. Keep his instruction. Not what I not what I want to do. Keep what he said to. You bound by his law, not by what you want. A lay person shall not eat of a holy things. No foreign guest of the priest or hired worker shall eat of the holy things. But verse eleven, pay attention. If a priest buy a slave as his property for money, the slave may eat of it, and may one born in his house may eat of the food. What? No layman could, can, cannot eat this food. But there is a man who can eat. What kind of man? The priest buys a slave as his property for money. What does this mean? I want you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And read this and tell me the answer. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. We're going to read from verse 12 and on. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. Food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food. And good will destroy, uh, God will destroy both one and the other. Body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord. And the Lord for the body. And God raised the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are member of Christ? Shall I then take the member of Christ and make the member of prostitute? Never. Or do you not know that who is joined to a prostitute become one body with her? For it is as it is written. Remember, as it is written. Always go by the written. The two will become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord become one spirit with, with him. Flee from sexual immorality. 
every other sins a person commits outside the body, but the sexual immorality person sins against his own body? Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have, a fr- whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. Now, I want you to answer me. Going back to question I asked you. What does that mean? But if a priest buy a slave as his property for money, the slave may eat of it, and anyone born in his house may eat of his food. What does that mean? Jesus paid his price to buy me with his blood. He paid the price, precious, most precious price for me through his blood. The creator's blood. He completely damaged, permanently damaged himself to buy me and you so then I'm I am the slave that Jesus paid the price to buy me so that I can eat the holy food do you understand I'm not supposed to be but he paid the price to buy me I am the slave. I'm not worthy. But he paid the price so that I can eat the food of God. Coming back. If a priest's daughter marries a layman, she shall not eat of the contribution of the holy things. But if a priest's daughter is a widow or divorced, and has no child and returns to her father's house as in her youth she may eat of her father's food yet no lay person shall eat of it no lay person should eat of it you have to be bought or you have to be born in in his house to eat the holy food and if anyone eats of a holy thing unintentionally he shall add the fifth of its value to it and give the holy things to the priest. What is it? If anyone eats of a holy thing unintentionally, he shall add the fifth of the fifth of its value to it. Fifth. What is a fifth? Grace. They shall not profane the holy things of the people of Israel, which they can con- Contribute to the Lord, and so cause them to bear iniquity and guilt by eating their holy things. For I am the Lord who sanctif- uh, sac- uh, sanctifies them. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron and his sons, all the people of Israel, say to them, When any one of the house of Israel or of the sojourner in Israel presents a burnt offering as his offering, for any of their vows and free will offering that they offer to the Lord, if it is to be accepted for you, it shall be a male without blemish, or the bulls, or the sheep, or the goats. You shall not offer anything that has a blemish, for it will not be acceptable to you. And when anyone offers sacrifice, a peace offering to the Lord to fulfill a vow, or as a free will offering from the herd or from the flock, to be accepted it must be perfect. There shall be no blemish in it. Once again, how could we be sinless? Only through the blood of Jesus Christ. We could only be clean. Then we'll be offered to the Lord. If it is not, then we can never offer ourselves to the Lord. Animals blind or disabled or mutilated or having a discharge or an itch or scabs you shall not offer to the Lord or given them to the Lord as a food offering on the altar. Once again, if we have a sins in any shape of perform, we can never be offered to the Lord. God will not accept it. 
You may present a bull or a lamb that has a part too long or too short for a free will offering, but for a vow offering, it cannot be accepted. Any animal that has its testicle bruised or crushed or torn or cut, you shall not be uh, shall not offer to the Lord. You shall not do it within your hand. Neither shall you offer as the bread of your God as a such animal gotten from a foreigner, since there is a blemish in them because of their mutilations, they will not be accepted for you. You could offer it, you can give it with the blemish, but you know what? God will not accept it. Then you may say, But I gave it, I gave the offerings, I burnt it. Yeah, you gave it, but not be accepted. Once again, let's go to uh, Malachi for a second, quickly. Malachi, the last book of the Old Testament, right before Matthew. Chapter 1. A son, verse uh, chapter 1, verse 6. A son honors his father, and a servant is master. If then I am a father, where is my honor? And if I am a master, where is my fear? Says the Lord of hosts to you, O priest, who despise my name, but you say, How have we despised your name? By offering polluted food upon my altar. But you say, How have we polluted you? By saying that the Lord, Lord's table may be despised when you offer blind animals in sacrifice, is that not evil? And when you offer those that are lame or sick, is that not evil? Present that to your governor. Will he accept you or show you a favor, says the Lord of hosts, and not entreat the favor of God that you may be gracious to us with such a gift from your hand will he show favor to you, to any of you says the lord of hosts oh that there were one among you who would shut the door that you might not kindle fire on my altar in vain i have no pleasure in you says the lord of hosts and i will not accept offering from your hands for from the uh, rising of the sun to its setting, my name will be great among the nations, and in every place incense will be offered to my name, and pure offering, for my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. But you profaned it when you say that the Lord's table is polluted, and its fruit, that is, its food may be despised. But you say, what a, weary, a weariness that is, and you snort at it, says the Lord of hosts. You bring what? has been taken by violence or the lame or sick, and this you bring as your your off, offerings? Shall I, shall I accept that from your hand? Says the Lord. Cursed be the cheat who has the male in his flock and vows it, and yet sacrifice to the Lord what is blemished. For I am a great king, says the Lord of hosts, and my name will be fear among the nations. They brought all this lame, blemished, blind, they burnt it. And they said, when did we despise you? What do you mean? I gave the animals as you told me to just give as offering. I burnt it. But what is God saying? I never received it. And then on top of it, I'm sick and tired of your, your offering. I want someone to close the door so no one can come in with this blemish things. I'd rather not see it. Don't do it. I'm sick and tired of what you do. You don't fear me. You don't have a heart for me. But they say, what do you mean? I brought the animal. I burned it. I spent money. I burnt it. I gone through this this, you know, offering to you. But God takes no pleasure. That's what I've been keep saying. Just because you've been going to church for all your life, 
just because you participate in all this activity in the church, just because you went to a mission field, just because you taught someone, just because you gave the offering, don't mean anything if you have no heart for the Lord. If you don't have a contrite heart, if you don't tear your heart, what you did is meaningless to the Lord. I never received it. And that's what God said in Leviticus. But that's not what people did. They did what they think is right. Not what God said. Coming back to Leviticus chapter 22 again. Verse 23, you may present the bull or lamb that has a part too long or too short for a free will offering, but for a vow offering it cannot be accepted. Any animal that has its testicle bruised or crushed or torn or cut your shell, not offer to the Lord. You shall not do it within your land. Neither shall you offer as the bread of your God as a such animals gotten from a foreigner, since there is blemish in them because of their mutilation they will not be accepted for you. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, When an ox or sheep or goat is born, it shall remain seven days within its mother, and from the eighth day on it shall be acceptable as a food offering to the Lord. I mentioned many times, I told you. Remember? Eighth day. What is eighth day? Eight is Jesus. But you shall not kill an ox or a sheep and her young in one day. And when you sacrifice a sacrifice, a thanksgiving to the Lord, you shall sacrifice, sacrifice it so that you may be accepted. It shall be eaten on the same day. You shall not leave none of it until morning. I am the Lord. So you shall keep my commandments and do them. I am the Lord. And you shall not profane my holy name that I may be sanctified among the people of Israel. I am the Lord who sanctifies you, who brought you out of the land of Egypt to be your God. I am the Lord. Is that pretty clear to you? not about what you think do it the way God told us to do know the God's words in order for you to do what God wants us to do do it the way he said not the way I want not the way I think build your faith upon rock build your faith upon Jesus build your faith upon the word God told us I give you one thing. First Corinthians again. Actually chapter chapter four. First Corinthians chapter four. I have said many times this. First Corinthians chapter four, verse six. I have applied all these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit, brother, that you may learn by us not to go beyond what is written. Not to go beyond what is written. Don't try to go beyond what is written? But we always try to go beyond the word because we simply don't know the word. We simply don't know what is written in the scriptures. I emphasize many times, please do not do what you think it's right. Do 
what God said. Do what is written. But in order for you to do what is written, you have to know what is written first. Period. Or up to this point. 